Father, right now as we dive headlong into the second part in this series, we ask and we pray in the very name of Jesus that as we continue on with this thought process, as we continue on looking at the concept and the concepts that are within fast food in the gospel, that you give us fuller understanding. Help us to grasp what it is that you have for us, not just right now, but how you want us to take this, to touch others with this, and even more, ultimately continue to serve in the capacities that you placed us in. Guide us and bless us as we continue this dialogue together. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, after every single speaking appointment, Dr. Henry had one favorite thing that he loved to do. He loved to go shopping. <laughs> now here's something that you have to understand. Dr. Henry in his younger days grew up in a time and place where he didn't have very much. Now he thought that every single person when it came to what they had, that they had the same thing, you know, two pairs of shirts, two pairs of socks, two pairs of whatever. But obviously all of us know that some people ought to have more stuff. And so when Dr. Henry got older he, and he had more money under his belt, he said, you know, I may not have a lot of things, but one thing I do know is that I will have shoes. And so after this one at speaking appointment, he and his secretary knew that he had a number of hours before he was flying back home. So they went to the went to the local mall. Secretary really wasn't that eager to shop, but um, they go past this one store and she saw it. She's like, oh, I'm gonna just go back to the hotel, wait until time to fly out. Dr. Henry got really excited because he saw a four letter sign that a lot of people like. The sign said, sale. But here's what was interesting, the store that he saw was Neiman Marcus. <laughs> and as people know, if you remember that name, Neiman Marcus is known for their high dollar prices. And he, so he goes in and he starts looking around, looks at the ties and flips it over and he sees the price and he's like, oh man, that's a house payment, puts it back. And he goes around and he sees the shoes and right there, the sign was again that it was on sale. And he goes and he starts to look through them and finds this perfect, perfect fit. And the problem was, is there was, he only found one shoe. Now, this isn't like where you would go to Target or Walmart where you have both shoes and you could put them on and then you can walk out of the store after you paid for them. There was only one shoe there and he puts it on and he feels it around and sales associate comes and starts talking with him. Asks him if he likes that, and he said, oh yeah, you know, I do. And he said, hold on just a minute, let me go and get, get the other one. And Dr. Henry tries on the other one, and all oh, perfect fit. And the sales associate said, you know, this is the last pair that we have, and I'm so glad that it's in your size. Are you interested in buying it? He said, well, I don't know, I don't have, this guy's like, you know, no, no, we have this on sale because this happens to be our last pair that we have in the store. So he, oh, oh, that's, that's great. Goes up to the counter, pays for it, and sales associate looks at him and says, well, so what, what do you want to do? Do you want to wear these out? Oh, yes, I want to wear these out. Okay, well, here's what I'll, I'll do. I'll take your other shoes and I will ship them to the to you. <laughs> Back to his mind, he's thinking, oh no. You know, everywhere from here to home, all these postal workers will be going, oh, what died in that box? Oh, this smells awful. And so he has the shoes on and he wears them out. A couple months later, he comes back to the exact same space for another speaking engagement has same amount of hours before he has to take off so secretary asks him again and she's like oh so what do you want to do dr henry and he's like let's go shopping 
And she's like, oh, you want to go to Neiman Marcus? He's like, uh, of course. They go there, no sales sign. He walks through, walks through the shoe department. And as he walks through, he hears his name being called, Dr. Henry, do you like your shoes? And oh, he was so excited about his shoes. He started looking down, talking to, to his shoes, talking about them. And then he looked up and the sales associate was nowhere to be seen. Parents are grabbing their children, going, oh, yes, honey. He loves his shoes, doesn't he? Running off. And Dr. Henry feels so, so embarrassed because no one's there and he's talking to himself. And he starts to walk away. But then the sales associate comes out with a box. And he said, Dr. Henry, here's what I want you to understand. The shoes that you have are defective. And because of that, we're going to give you a brand new pair. Because when it comes to Neiman Marcus, we are about quality. And he, oh, no, no, you don't have to do this. And he said, you know, your shoes were the only one left because of what was going on. And the sales associate looked at him and said something that to this day he still remembers. He said this, you know, so often we say that the customer is always right. It doesn't matter what's going on. Many times the customer will never be right. But when it comes to Neiman Marcus, our philosophy is this. The customer is always served. You know, when was the last time that we as Christians thought about that? That as we're going and as we're doing the different tasks that God has called us to do, that we remember the very fact that God continues to call us to serve anyone and everyone, no matter what locale, no matter what they look like, no matter what they've done, no matter what their education, no matter what of whatever it is, we're called to serve humanity because we're all kids of God. None of us will ever be right, but all of us should always be served. And even more, it's not just that we should do this, but we follow because the master did this and he set a precedence because I have done this. Now I call you to go and do the same. You know, we last time we looked at John chapter six, verses one through 14, where we saw the story of Jesus feeding 5,000 plus people. And it's interesting with what happens next. Hope you have your Bibles with you right now, right beside you, whether that be the actual hard copy, small or big, or if you have the electronic version. John chapter six, today we're, what we're gonna be looking at, we're gonna continue on in this thought process. We're looking at verses 15 to 30. Now verse 15 continues on this thought from what we left off last week. So let's pick up there. Verse 15 says this, so Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force and make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Right there, Jesus, Jesus is Jesus. He knows what's gonna happen even before it happens. But Jesus sees that these people are ready to crown him king. Or should I say also this, there was a large percentage that wanted to make him king, and then there was also a percentage that just wanted to crown him because they didn't like what he was doing. He wasn't following the norms of the day, wasn't following what their agenda happened to be. So they wanted to bob him over the head and to get him back onto what they were supposed to have instead of what his agenda really was. So right there we see Jesus already sending the disciples away and he slips away by himself to spend time with the Father. You know, it doesn't matter what time in earth's history we live in, there is a constant reminder when it comes to service. Again and again, we need to have those times that we slip away and we're continually talking with the Father. 
continually re-energizing our batteries. If we're not plugging into the source continually, how can we expect to have the power for service that we're needing as we're going out serving these people? Remember, it's kind of hard to drink from an empty cup. It's harder to serve from an empty dish that you haven't even done anything with. Right there, we see Jesus slipping away right there. And then verse 16, now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Jesus had already sent them off. Now they come back, they get in their boat, and they start with what Jesus had, had given them to do. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. Right there, how often is it in our own lives that it seems that Jesus is not there and we're continually hit by all these winds and waves and turmoil that the world produces? Or dare I even say, let, let's step back. Because here's what we need to remember. Too often we say that it's the world that's causing our problems when the very scriptures itself speak to the fact that it's not from without that you have to worry about. It's from, from within that the problems come. Right here, the disciples are in, their, in the boat. They're rowing for all their might. These are strong men. Strong guys, strong fishermen, most of them. But they see Jesus, and they're frightened. Now, here's what's interesting. That the concept that's actually given within the original language gives the point where it's not just this, oh, I'm scared of what's underneath the bed. No, it is that you are so frightened to your core that almost like you wake up in the middle of the night and your bed is extremely soaked. You are, you are so weak because you've seen something that you can't explain. That's what the disciples are going through right there. But then add a million percent more to that. And that's what they're, what they're having to go through. They can't even explain what it is that they're seeing let alone if, if it might be Jesus himself. But the story doesn't just stop there. Verse 20, But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Don't you love that? Every single time that Jesus continues to come into our equation, that's the first thing that he continues to say to us. Hey, I'm here. Don't be afraid. And even more, when he sends one of the angels, that's one of the first things they say. I've been sent by God. Don't be afraid. Fear is such a natural thing when it comes, but God wants us to understand, keep your focus on me. Keep your service where I've intended it to be. Everything's going to be fine. Just focus on me. Focus on the core of the gospel, which that is, is in me. And even more, what is within me is for you to go out, not only show others of me, but ultimately to continue to serve as I continue to send you out. Verse 21, so they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was, on, was at the land to which they were going. Can you imagine that? The moment they go, oh, it's Jesus. Come, come, come back in the boat. Jesus puts both feet in the boat and all of a sudden they're already on the other side. When God is in our vessel, amazing things happen. It's not just because of him being in the vessel. It's because of the fact that he has promised 
that he is going to see us through everything and anything that happens. All we have to do is continually trust, to have faith that even though we cannot see what he's doing, we cannot even imagine what's going on, he's got a greater plan in store that is going to see us through and then some. But here's what's interesting, verse 22. The next day the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Don't you just love that? <laughs> they know how he got there. I mean, a lot of these a lot of these fishermen of the time would have been right there on, on the sea fishing. So when you see this giant nightlight walking on the sea, obviously you know who this is going to be. But they come, all these people continually following Jesus no matter what. Not just because they wanted to be with them, him, but ultimately because they wanted to crown him king. But that whole question, Rabbi! Jesus, Master, how did you get here? Can you imagine Jesus looking at them going, huh, Jesus, why are you following me? What, 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 what is it that you really want? What are you truly seeking? You know, even with that, as we throw that question out from their time, from their paradigm, we need to look at this from our times and from our paradigm. Because Jesus continues to throw out the same thing to us. Because so often we throw out that same question where we go, Master, Jesus, Rabbi, how is it that you're here right now with us? How is it that you're doing all this? How is it that you provided all these things that we will never understand? And he just continues to shake his head going, really, do you really not see do you really not understand what I did with giving these people food so fast so that they would be able to eat? Do you really not know what the good news of the gospel means? Even more, do you not realize that the reason why I sent you out to serve is so that you could have characters like me? So that you would continue following step by step, by step, through the way that I've set up. But our problem so often is just like the apostles of old, where the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Sanhedrin came to them and they started calling them the way because they considered that these people were in their way. But let me take this and let me look at it from a different perspective with you right now. How often is it that we say that we are a part of the way, but really we're in God's way of doing the very work that he's called others to do? It doesn't matter what, what the denomination happens to be that we call ourselves. Too often, because of a denomination, we end up in the way of God and others that we make others stumble. When it comes down to it, and ultimately with faith, we're called to follow the Lamb no matter where he, he leads. That is faith in verity. Now when it comes to the denominations and everything else, we've got a way that we continue because we've got a way with a family of faith. But at the same time, we need to make sure that that family of faith that we're with is continuing to follow the Lamb no matter where He leads and is not in God's way. That's what the essence of the gospel and service in a nutshell is within itself. 
But let's continue on with this story in the last couple of verses that we have. Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of loaves and were filled. Right there, that seems like a slap in the face or a slap in the back of the head, where Jesus goes, hey guys, you, you really don't get it. I, I didn't do this just so that you will have a sign. I did it so that you would know even more who I am. But he goes, hey, all you're wanting is your stomach to be continually fed. You want someone that's going to speak the word and the dead will be raised up again so that they can fight. People, I didn't come to take over or to destroy the Roman Empire. My purpose is more than you can imagine. You know, here's what's interesting even with saying that. If the master said that, that should be our same response. That the reason why we go out, the reason why we serve, has a greater and bigger responsibility than anyone could ever imagine. And that picture, even to us, is more than we can fathom because we've just scratched the surface of what God is truly asking us to do. Verse 27, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Right there, even today we have to remember this that so often we look at, okay, God, what do I have to, what do I have to do to work for eternal life? And God, even to this day, is still, still there shaking his head going, you don't get it. It's who you believe in. It's who you have a relationship in. It's who you have faith in. Because ultimately, true faith when it's put into practice, it becomes a faith that works. Because when you love someone so much, it's automatically that these things will come from it. And that's what this faith is all about, that Jesus is trying to get them to understand. But even more, the faith that he's trying to get us to understand as well. But, you know, we can look through the gospel stories and we see the picture now that even though Jesus continued to tell them time and time and time again, they still did not get it because they had such a disconnect that it was hard for them to truly believe what he was really saying in a faith that was supposed to be grounded in God, not within themselves. But we have one last verse that I want us to take a look at, and this is going to be the springboard that's going to carry us into next week's part three. That's going to be very important as we continue on with this. Verse 30, so they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Right there, they still haven't gotten it. All they're asking for continually, show us a sign, give us a message, give us food, give us this, give, 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 give. Does that sound familiar? If it sounds familiar, it's because that's something that even our people continue to do to this day. Jesus, as they're asking him this question, is shaking his head with tears running down his cheeks, going, people, you still haven't gotten it. It's not about a sign. It's not about foods. It's about a relationship. It's about a relationship that goes out and continues to serve. What is it right now that we're missing that we need to put into practice to go forward? I want to leave you with this final thought as we close. Service, in essence, is not about showing, us, showing people anything. What it is about is living a life that's different 
that shows people Jesus and even more it's about living a sermon in shoes remember this preach always use words if necessary let's pray father that's what we need to remember right now is that we can preach a sermon with our lives we don't have to say a single thing father guide us bless us as we continue to go forward as we continue to learn of you in you and continue to live our lives as you continue to call us to serve guide us father bless us as we continue to look towards you and you alone this is our prayer in the name of jesus we pray amen once again as always i'm so glad that you've joined us um like i always mention encourage you to join us on tuesdays and thursdays with the devotional once again that's district devotional dot blogspot dot com tuesdays we've got our written devotionals thursday we've got our video devotional once again that's district devotional dot blogspot dot com and i look forward to seeing you next week as we continue to study god's word together god bless